Well, without further ado, I'd like to invite James Bartel up to the stage. Now, we've only first met today, but he is, uh, I've been very impressed with what you guys are doing, so we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So Thank welcome you. very much, James. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for coming this morning, and it's genuinely an honour for me to, to be able to come and talk a little bit about our story and uh, what, what we've been doing over the past eight years, actually. But, um, you know, one thing that really stood out to me this morning was Pemba's um, history, and that adversity is probably the thing that stood out to me as really shaping the man that he's become today, and that he has the ability now to be able to continue to look and have hope in the future. Um, for me, even still today, it is that hope in the future that really drives me. It's the hope in the future of what could be that um, motivates me to keep going even though uh, the challenges sometimes seem too high. Like I said, uh, eight years ago we started on a journey to try and right a wrong that we were made aware of. And this morning, I guess, talking you through some of that journey, what I would hope that you take from it is that... Uh, that really, you know, although still a very small uh, impact on the global problem that we're attacking, a small start can make quite a large impact on a community. Um, and like Rob also spoke about, that when we take those first steps uh, into this probably ambitious goal of wanting to uh, fight a problem like human trafficking or poverty within the world, um, we need to take that first step. And for me, the first step was actually going to the movies. Uh, well, it was where I was made aware of the problem for the very first time when I watched the, the Taken movie, the Liam Neeson film. Although fictional, really powerful and very confronting. And at the end of the movie, there was some script that came up saying that these things still happen around the world. And the movie is about, for those who haven't seen it, it's about a... Uh, well, Liam Neeson being the, uh, the star of, the, of the, uh, the film and his daughter and her friend travelling through uh, Europe and on that trip they were um, abducted and uh, stolen, sold for sex. And, you know, at the time I didn't have any little girls of my own but I had two nieces and I remember thinking, like, there's nothing, that, no end, you know, I could absolutely do what Liam Neeson has done and I would kill those guys, there's no question. And leaving that film, that's what I wanted to do, was actually start some kind of vigilante and go out there and find these kinds of people and kill them. And I thought that I would be doing such a service to the world in doing that. My wife was with me that, that night and she reminded me that um, I didn't have anywhere near the abilities that Liam Neeson had in that area and <laughs> that I probably wouldn't last the first 24 hours. And, you know, we went on to research what this problem really looked like from there. And... Um, we were astounded at the size of this problem. You know, there's um, over 40 million slaves in the world today, and um, I was so ignorant at this time that I thought that slavery had been wiped out with William Wilberforce. Um, he's one of my heroes. He was a guy that um, ended, um, he, he was a part of abolishing the slave trade um, in the 1800s, and you know, that, that guy actually really, I think, gave his life to, to the cause. He was a politician who, who uh, fought really hard to, to change the mindset of people. And that's really how he won uh, his battle was by changing the mindset of people and, and by, by being able to educate them to this idea that, although it seems crazy to us, that these people of different skin colour to us were equally human being as us. And I know that's just unbelievable for us to even, for a second, fathom that any human being could look at somebody with a different coloured skin and see them as any less human than us. But back then they really did, and they were slaves, and, and that was actually, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a, a heavy Christian uh, culture, and um, the Christians in that time also, um, reading from the same Bible I read from, enslaved people. And so what it highlights is culture and the way culture impacts the decisions we make on a daily basis. So I watched this movie 
wanted to become some sort of um, action star, kill these people, realised I couldn't, and spent the next couple of years researching and learning a little bit more until I went to a uh, music festival and met an organisation that was actively involved in identifying and rescuing um, victims um, of sexual exploitation. Uh, they invited me to come and see what they did and I jumped on an aeroplane with a colleague of mine and we flew into Thailand. We went to a place called Pattaya, to a famous area there called Walking Street, which is, I'm told, well, was told at the time, it was actually the sex, sex capital of the world. This is eight years ago. And I wanted to see what it really looked like for somebody to be sold for sex. And as I walked up Walking Street, I wasn't impacted. It felt a bit gross. Um, but everybody looked happy and I didn't really understand until I got to the end of the street and I saw a little girl for sale. You can't unsee it. She couldn't be more than 12 or 13 years old and when you see that, you can't go home and do nothing. We travelled into Cambodia from there and I saw the poverty and I saw the need and I saw the people that were also having to sell themselves or be sold by somebody else on the streets. This happens here in Australia as well. It happens in every corner of the earth. And I was quite ambitious at the time and very entrepreneurial and I thought, well, I'm going to start a business that's going to solve this problem. But the last thing I want to do is start a t-shirt company because I know so many people on the Gold Coast that have t-shirt brands and I don't want to be another. We're going to make denim jeans. Oh man, I wish I'd gone through the Coast Artist Program because I spent the next, the next six years trying to develop a business model that would actually work. Being able to actually take somebody out of a, a situation like they had found themselves in being trafficked for um, a range of different reasons and then teach them how to make the most difficult garment on the planet, but also not just the most difficult pla uh, garment on the planet, planet, but also the, ma the most competitive area of fashion as well. Well, I was entirely ignorant to all of these things, and I didn't bother researching any of that. I just started. <laughs> Actually, today I, I say that one of the advantages that we've had as a, as a company is that um, ignorance was absolutely present in a lot of what we were going to do. And I know that probably works against things Wes might tell you, and it's certainly against what um, Pemba's advice gave us this morning, and, and although those things are really, really important, it comes back to one, and the most important fundamental core um, necessity that you will have in running any kind of social enterprise, let alone just, just even just your own business. And that is, how far are you prepared to go to reach this goal? And what are you prepared to give up to get there? You know, there's been so many times throughout our journey where I've wanted to give up, and I've got to be honest with you, the last couple of months has been the hardest couple of months that I've ever had in business. It's been the greatest temptation to quit than I've ever had, and we're experiencing more success than I could have dreamed of. Success doesn't actually mean what we're taught it means. Success is very different, and especially when you start a business to try and impact people's lives. Going through this journey, um, there was a few realizations we made, and one of them was really quite a surprise to me that I would actually care about this because right throughout my growing up years, I was actually, um, I spent most of my growing up years out, out in Longreach actually, just where uh, Coast Artists, I think, was launched in Australia. And anybody that came to me and talked to me about tree clearing being a terrible thing or um, any environmental issues actually, I thought was a tree-hugging hippie. And I honestly thought, well, you vote for the Greens so you don't, you don't have my support and I'm not going to listen. Now, I'm not a Green supporter and I apologise for anybody who is here, but um, over this period of um, going through this journey, I started to realise that it's not actually possible to separate environmental and human social issues, which is shocking to me that I would come to that conclusion. We work in the fashion space, and uh, for a lot of you guys here uh, are from, from fashion, I know, and um, you'll be well aware of this, but for those of you who are not, 
The fashion industry is arguably between their fifth and the second worst polluter, depending on whose research you listen to, um, or CO2 em emissions contributor in the world. It is a horrible, horrible, horrible industry on that level. It impacts more people and the planet in worse ways than you and I can actually imagine. I don't know if you've watched River Blue or The True Cost of Fashion or any of those films, but they are very eye-opening as to the impact the clothes we wear every day have on the environment and the people that make them. In fact, it was quite challenging to me because actually the community and the um, culture that I grew up in, again, a, um, a Christian based, I grew up in churches, and um, I can remember how I was taught, um, not wasn't preached from the pulpit, but I was taught in the way that we, we conducted our, our lives that actually cheap fashion was a good thing. And the reason for that was because we spend less on ourselves so that we can give more, which is a great thing. But as I've come to learn is actually, the sad part about that is what we're actually doing is enslaving people just like they did in the 1800s. We are those that are holding these people captive so that we can have more fashion, cheaper, so that we can live the lifestyle that we would like to live. The private sector actually contributes about 90% of jobs in all developing countries and provides funds for about 60% of investments. And so this is why I'm passionate to be here this morning to talk to you guys, because you are from the private sector predominantly. I believe the private sector has the ability to completely revolutionise the world, and that's a big dream, of course, but I guess I wonder where your mind is at in this. You know, when I asked some of my staff um, in, the, in the earlier days, whose job do they believe it is to solve some of the social issues of our community, the answer I would get was two different answers. Generally, those 40 and above would say ours, and generally, those 30 and below, or 40 and below, would say the governments. Well, I want to pose to you again for the second time this morning, as Rob has already done, I would say that that job is absolutely ours. The social and environmental concerns that we have on a greater scale than ever before in history are our problems, and they are our problems to work within and solve now. But I think it goes beyond just us as individuals. I think it goes into the private sector. I think it is, it's our job as business owners um, and entrepreneurs to be able to think about ways that we can impact the community around us and solve some of the social needs that, that surround us, as well as environmental ones. So the Outland Denim business model is all about that. It's built on four pillars. The first thing is we give opportunity to women, um, predominantly, but now also excitingly, men as well, um, that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to be able to get a job. We work in Cambodia and we work with a range of different people from vulnerable backgrounds. They may have been sold for sex, trafficked for labour, uh, they may have a severe disability or being vulnerable on the streets. Our job is to be able to bring people like that in that don't have any skills and skill them into a prosperous future where they become the catalyst for the change in their own families and then in their own communities. Once you bring somebody like this into your, uh, into your operation though, you have some pretty serious responsibilities. And the first responsibility is how are they going to earn their income? So we now need to pay them a living wage, which you would understand is a lot of the time, especially in developing countries, different to a minimum wage. A living wage means they get to live a lifestyle like we get to enjoy. It means that they can have health care, that they can go and become educated and send their children to be educated. They can have a home, believe it or not, somewhere to sleep at night and food, maybe even go out for dinner on a Friday night. They are all the basic fundamental things that create a living wage. 
So now you've got somebody that's coming into your care that doesn't actually have any skills, so therefore can't actually earn you any money, but you've got to pay them a living wage. But on top of that, now we need to train them as well so that one day they can be of benefit to our business. So they go through uh, a training program to where they start to learn how to make a denim jean. After about two and a half to three years, one of the major differences in working within this model versus the traditional model of manufacturing is that these women will be able to make an entire denim jean. In a normal factory, you'll have a massive long production line where you might have somebody who's made back pockets for their entire life. I mean, they're good at it and they're really fast at it, so it makes a lot of sense on that level, but there's no job satisfaction in there. And so for us, it's really important about being able to create a working environment that gives them everything they need to thrive. And that's not just at work, that's in their entire life. So they've been given an opportunity, they're getting paid a living wage, they're now being trained into their job, so now they're of value to the company. Um, but they're earning more money than they've ever earned before as well, and so education becomes one of the most vital keys in them having the freedom to be able to have success. So that's education around finance or languages, healthcare, infant care. One of the stories I always love to tell because I find it so shocking is that one of the major drug companies that we probably all have their products within our homes went through Southeast Asia a number of years ago with a marketing campaign to uneducated people telling them that the best thing that mothers can do for their children is to feed them baby formula. So now we don't just have these mothers who can't afford baby formula, they're, they're, they're living with this guilt going, now I have to be able to get baby formula if I genuinely love my infant, and I'm going to feed them this baby formula. And for those that were unlucky enough to live on water supplies that were contaminated by industry and predominantly by the fashion industry, they're now mixing this contaminated water and feeding it to their infants. There are so many layers of this kind of thing that has gone on for decades in these countries that are developing, that are working hard to develop. Cambodia, only 40 years ago, suffered the most horrific genocide that went through that country and ravaged these people's lives. You don't meet anybody there that hasn't been impacted by it. Yet then a drug company can come in and start to market and, and take advantage of these people that have already suffered so much. But this isn't an uncommon story. This is actually now every single developing poor nation in the world. And we here in this extremely rich country have the ability to change it. And in fact, I think we have the ability to change it without actually changing our lifestyles. We set this business up because I was tired of charity. I don't like give back programs. I love business that has the values that will genuinely change people's lives and change industry. So we spent the first six years developing this business model and then uh, I made a pretty, pretty brutal mistake really, but um, I decided that we were going to launch along with a with an agency that had a pretty big database and we were going to do this, this big launch of black jeans and, and sell them to the public. And I was so optimistic that I ha we made thousands of them. We brought in the best Turkish, beautiful, premium fabrics, constructed them, brought them here, and the campaign never went anywhere. We did. In fact, I've still got them sitting on our shelf up there because we're not quite sure what to do. them. too good to throw away and recycle, but not good enough to sell. I've had a lot of those mistakes actually throughout the journey that, and, and nearly every single time they've been big enough mistakes that it's nearly knocked us off our feet and we couldn't recover. But every time I come back and I picture that 12 year old girl that stood on the street for sale, I could see how scared she was. I could tell she was intimidated and in fact the, the representative from the agency that had taken me thought that it was a potential it was her first night by how fearful she looked. I walked away from that girl that night having done nothing and I often wonder what her life looks like now. Social enterprise is the future. In fact I would say that anybody running a business that isn't thinking about the people that work within it and the people that you service to begin with as being the priority need to go back to business school 
and actually learn about what business, the fundamentals of business is about. As we started to learn about marketing and how do we put our product forward, we came up against some pretty, pretty solid challenges. And um, because, of, because of time, and I want to give you, you uh, the opportunity to ask some questions, um, I'm going to skip through the, the rest of this quite quickly. Um, but one thing I think that I've learned above everything is we can go out there with a bleeding heart and want to change the world and solve these problems. But unless we have a beautiful product, we won't change anything. In fact, all we'll ever be is just another charity, someone buying something they don't really want or need. And so my challenge to every business, social enterprise or not, is go back to your product and look at your product and how is it different, how is it better, how does it benefit the world. And if you can't tick some of those boxes, then, in fact, I'd probably then suggest that maybe it's not worth it. Or maybe you need to tweak it or change it or use the success that you've got to be able to tick some of those boxes. Our product took a long time to get right, and to this day, we are still tweaking and trying to improve to be able to get the product where it is. We've just launched with David Jones, and I was in the Queen Street um, store yesterday. And I was, the first thing I do is I never go and look at our product, I go and look at everybody else's. And I look at how does it present on the shelf versus how does ours present on the, on the shelf. And it's never thinking that we've got there. It's looking at the best brands that have been at it for decades and being able to see what they do and learn from what they do and get advice from others to be able to be better and better and every season be better again and better again. You know, we've had a lot of fortunate success in the last in the last six months in particular. But I want to tell you about a period that, that from the, the moment we launched the Outland Denim brand, which is at the end of 2016, we have honestly just miraculously, not because I have had great strategy in place, because it's nearly, a, uh, I tell you, it's nearly a day-to-day -day strategy at the moment, um, but because I believe that we put in the foundational work to have something that was genuine and real doors have opened globally for us. My wife saw this WWD summit advertised in New York and she's like, you need to go to this. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to that. Like, it's, it's going to cost way too much. We can't afford it. But she was adamant and a couple of her friends were adamant that I must go to this. And I went to this, this summit and I thought, well, the good thing is I'm going to hear from Ralph Lauren and the godfathers of our industry. And they'll be talking about sustainability and I guess I will learn a lot. And I went in and I heard nothing about people or planet. I heard about what country to go to next to produce cheaper. And it was a resounding comment that came from speaker after speaker who just did not care. I was really, I guess, um, angry and thought that this is the, the crappest industry in the world, full of the crappest people in the world, and why would you be part of it? And then I sat at a round table like this, there was two fellows talking across from me and sort of sat on my own, not really knowing what to do, um, wanting to just be back in Australia. And this Canadian guy goes, oh, hey, mate, what do you do? And I said, oh, we make jeans. And he said, oh, you make jeans? Oh, yeah, what do you do? And I told him about the concept and he's like, oh, another one that's going to lose all his money. <laughs> I remember going home after that trip feeling like, oh my gosh, what have I done? At that stage, I had an investor as well, and I had a lot of his money tied up in this. And I thought, I've lost all his money, and I've given hope to all these people in Cambodia that I just can't follow through on this. But for six months, I kept pursuing that guy in Canada, and eventually he said, oh, he goes, so strange. My wife had a dream about your brand last night. He goes, uh, what, look, why don't you just come over? Um, I've never seen your product other than the jeans you wore. Bring them, and we'll, we'll just have, we'll have a chat. So I excitedly jumped on an aeroplane and flew to Canada and got off in Toronto and showed them the jeans. And they went, oh, yeah, they're, they're not bad. So we took a risk and organized three meetings with the probably top three um, retailers in Canada. He said, it's so strange. I've never actually got in the door with one of them, but they've, they've agreed to meet. So we went in and... It was, um, I don't know if you've ever watched Devil Wears Prada, but man, it was like a reenactment of 
these women walk in and they said to him, his name is Mike. He said, oh, you must be Mike. Yeah, you got 20 minutes, get your stuff on the table, we'll be back soon. Even Mike started shaking. He's had 30 years of this, but I was so nervous. I'm like, oh my gosh, are they going to, what are they going to do to us? And we lay our jeans out on the table and they walked in an hour and a half later, they're in tears and they're saying, how can we help? That's the best men's retailer on the entire planet. In fact, our first season sold one pair of jeans. <laughs> but they kept us. And our second season, we had about 15% sell through. But they kept us. And we're in our third season now. They didn't keep us because we're making money. They kept us because they need our story. We then went to the next meeting with a uh, billionaire, the Western family. She herself came to the meeting. Within an hour of our meeting, um, she had sent an email confirming that for 2018, we're going to support you and you'll be in our stores and we are still in their stores and we experienced the same thing. Really slow sell through. Nobody knew who we were. Nobody was going to buy our product over somebody else's. But it slowly built because we have a story. Because we have purpose. We're not just a brand. We're not just a product. We're not just a service. We have real purpose. The next one was Sporting Life, which is the third biggest. Um, uh, it sounds like a sporting store. It's not. It's a, it's a fashion store with lots of sporting goods as well, but department store in Canada and put us in there 11 doors straight away. Um, we then opened about 50 doors throughout Canada. And a stylist who's Canadian saw our product and heard about our story. That stylist just happened to be a stylist for Meghan Markle. I don't know, I reckon there would be a few guys in this room who don't, don't know who that is. And, <laughs> and I was also one of those guys. <laughs> so I got a message saying that... Um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have tried your jeans and love them. Didn't mean anything to me. I knew who Prince Harry was, all right? I didn't know that one. <laughs> I didn't know Meghan Markle was his wife. Didn't know who that was. I landed on, in Cambodia, actually, to go back and um, do some work. And I, I landed at night. I woke up in the morning, and my phone was full of notifications from Instagram and phone calls and emails. And I, what the hell is going on? And I, as I looked, I started to see that this Meghan Markle person, who's now a princess, landed in Australia wearing our jeans. Well, I didn't think that would have any kind of impact, really. I didn't. <laughs> but over the next 24 hours, we sold out of those jeans that she was wearing, globally. We experienced influx in traffic to our website like we'd never seen before. I think we had a 3,000% increase. I think averaged out, uh, I could get this a little bit wrong, but over the first, um, over those first uh, 48 hours, and then it slowly tapered, but was still really intense. But that's not what she did for us. She told our story. We had an absolute flurry of media globally in the biggest publications in the world. London Financial Times now a number of times. We're talking Vogue, L, the biggest. And what did they do? They used Meghan Markle as the headline but told our story over and over and over and over again. Meghan Markle doesn't align with brands that she doesn't believe in. Meghan Markle's looking for a story. She's looking for an impact. In fact, I would probably argue that there is a huge majority of celebrities today that are looking for a story. So, in fact, we've now been approached by major celebrities for sweat equity. Do you know what sweat equ equity is? Basically, I'll promote your brand, you give me equity in the company. And I say no. We have a brand that has as much to offer you as you do us. So just wear it. <laughs> well, I was sitting at the table there just, just literally, and I do apologize, I did look at an email, it popped up, and um, that was, oh gosh, what's her name? 
I don't know who celebrities are, but a celebrity right then, you could look, Rob, go into my phone for sure. Um, she's, some, <laughs> she's some Australian celebrity. Um, uh, she, she's, not, she's not Meghan Markle, but um, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, Ricky Lee. Um, so, so uh, just a stylist, uh, Ricky Lee would like to wear your jeans. Well, last week um, it was Leonardo DiCaprio. And um, be before Leonardo DiCaprio, we had Jessica Alba, and it's organic. We don't pay for this. It's not because we have the best jeans on the market, because we don't. It's because we spent six years building something that was so powerful that would change people's lives, that would have an environmental impact that fashion generally doesn't have, that people want to be part of it. We get stocked in the best department stores around the world because of that story, not because of our product. Our product has to be good and it has to sell, absolutely. And in fact, we have to focus on our product being the best. But now David Jones, they came to buy our product before Meghan Markle. Uh, I just need to make sure you, you realize that it's not because of Meghan Markle. David Jones came to buy our product and we didn't want to sell it to him because we didn't want it to just hang on a shelf in David Jones and, and, and just hang. But they came back and were persistent and they kept guaranteeing, no, we want to support you, we want to build your brand. And then Meghan Markle happened and Myers came to the table and we said, no, we don't want to go with you guys um, either. And they're like, we want to put you in all these doors. And we're like, no, we don't, we don't think that that's a good move for our brand because we want to go with David Jones. And David Jones goes, yeah, we actually think your brand needs exposure and, and we'd recommend you go with Myers as well. Well, I don't know about any of you guys that know anything about buying behavior between David Jones and Myers, but that doesn't happen. Again, because actually the change isn't made by us, the change is made by those who sell the product and those who buy it. And that's why this business model will change the world. Because when you buy a product that you need or want, you no longer need to donate to make the impact. You're making it in your everyday life with the things that you do every single day. And that's why I say I don't believe your lifestyle even has to change to change the world. We've got, I think, 10 minutes or five. Five or 10 minutes um, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, one thing I always love to say here is that um, we're Aussies. Um, I'm not going to swear here, but you probably f think that um, a lot of what I'm saying could be just a little bit um, embellished or, yeah, is that really? Ask the hard questions. The, the best Q&A times we ever have is when somebody is prepared to ask the hard questions because they're skeptical, they're part of our story, or ask anything, just go for it. Okay, so we're gonna open up the floor to do that. Um, so I'm gonna ask that you stay there. Yeah. That you repeat the question because it's being filmed. Right, right yeah, yeah. If you need to go, go, but I guess we've got a bit of time. Sure. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, far away, Helen. Um, my name's Helen, I'm from Team Challenge Queensland. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a really simple question for you, but first I'd like to say what I really appreciate is you sharing kind of your vulnerability and the warts and all the stuff, because I think no matter whether you're in the non-profit or business sector, you can have your, you know, notes and grind and, um, and not see the big picture um, of all the things kind of in there. So I really love that vulnerability. I've got a super easy question for you. Why the name Outland Denim? <laughs> Why the name Outland Denim? Well, um, oh, man, I really should have thought it through better because um, there isn't a good reason for it. In fact, uh, we're just sitting in the office one day going, what are we going to call this thing? And we're just throwing names around and someone said Outlander and we looked it up and there was a car. And so we went, what about Outland? And, and literally that's about it. We've tried to think of great reasons like, uh, you know, the top of mountaintops and bringing those from the outside in, which is why we exist, but that's not true. It's actually just, we like the name. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I'm here, then Neil. Hi, Helen Baker from On Your Own TV with Sonia. And I apologize, I need to scoot. So thank you so much. But we are also working in the sex trafficking space or anti-sex trafficking. So I would just like to know how many people you think you've actually rescued and changed those lives. Yeah, well, we have uh, 130 staff in total. Um, 
uh, it goes well beyond the staff you employ, as you know. Um, you know, one of the things is, um, and, and sorry, I didn't um, repeat that question, but the question was, um, how many people um, do we think we've been able to impact through, through this project? And we have 120 uh, 20 staff in Cambodia, 10 here in Australia, um, and the impact goes well beyond helping one. If you help a woman, the statistics would suggest that um, helping a woman versus a man, um, and, and I'm not a total famo, but um, I would say that, um, or the statistics would say that you actually have the ability to help a way greater number of people as the ripple effect um, because of, I, I would think, the maternal instinct of women and the way they, they care um, probably more naturally than men do. And um, so it's very hard to say. We're about to undergo some actual case studies with Nottingham University coming over with the sort of leading, um, Kevin Bowles' name, leading um, expert in modern slavery to conduct studies and, and track the impact of the business model. So um, in, in a year's time, we'll probably have some exciting data to share. But for the moment, I think, you know, it, it directly 120, yeah. James oh. Neil, sorry. <coughs> there you go. Hi, thank you. Hi, thanks so much for this. Thank you for allowing me to wear jeans to a networking breakfast besides your jeans. <laughs> I've had these since, I think, two and a bit years ago. I think Brian might have been one of the first pairs that went through pockets a bit mum. But <laughs> I love them and I still wear them because I love the story, which yeah. is case case of point. But I work in the image consulting and personal styling industry, and we have a um, online styling subscription. We're trying to change people's buying behaviour because what you talked about in how we can actually make change in culture through just changing our lifestyle—that's true. But if we consume at the rate that we're consuming, and we don't change our attitude towards stewardship, then we're still just buying expensive, feel-good products and a whole lot of them, and they're sitting around our wardrobe not helping anyone. So I wanted to ask what would be your advice or, or what has been your approach to looking at um, reducing consumption but still being profitable? Yeah, that's a great question. How do we reduce consumption and still be profitable? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a massive problem that we're facing today is overconsumption and, and you know, we're seeing not just fast fashion but luxury brands as well. Um, pushing um, excess stock into landfill, and so creating one of the worst envir environmental issues that we've faced in all time. So for us, that's partnerships with QUT and, um, and others as well, working on solutions to exactly that landfill and how do we repurpose, um, but better than repurpose, how do we actually eradicate these things from our production and supply chains that, that are harmful, the plastics, so forth. Um, one of the things that we would say, I guess, well, our jeans are a premium product, and so they're ranging from here in Australia, 200 to $230. Um, so most people aren't going to buy five pairs of our jeans. Um, they're going to buy one or two versus buy five pairs of cotton-on jeans or, or whatever uh, cheaper brand that they might usually purchase. So that's one thing. We charge more so they can't afford as many. Uh, <laughs> Second, second thing is the fabric choices. You know, it's really important. So you say the two and a half years, do, uh, old doesn't surprise me. Pa pockets are a bit mung. Um, they've come a long way. You probably drew for a new pair, Queen Street. <laughs> but look, honestly, um, fabric choices and, and the, the raw materials that you use are key in this. Following your supply chain, um, one, eradicating the slavery, which is different to this question, I know, from your supply chains, but then being able to bring um, products into your... Um, uh, sorry, raw materials into your product that last. And so for us, we use polyester, which is a, a very controversial um, issue at the moment within fashion and, and the production of fabrics um, because of the plastic components in it. There are some advantages, though, and I'd say one of the greatest advantages and the reasons that I, at the moment, think it's still the best solution is that when women wear skinny jeans, which they are just going to do, still the biggest seller, even though we see mum and boyfriend jeans coming in, skinny jeans sell more than anything. If they don't maintain their shape, you need another pair. The fabric that you're wearing there um, doesn't lose its shape. I mean, so two and a half years on, um, you could not wash them. Um, you know, they're probably lightened a little, so I think you have washed them a few times. But, um, you know, they, 
they won't lose their shape day after day. The, the jeans I'm wearing today, I've never washed these jeans, so don't get too close. But um, And honestly, I wore them yesterday as well, and I was eating a meat pie in the car, and it exploded. And so that's just wiped off. So there's remnants of that as well. But um, it, is, it is about um, washing less, you know, um, and conserving all the other environmental <coughs> excuse me, issues that we face there, but having the best raw materials so they last longer. Neil. Uh, James Neil Scott from Health Bridges College. I want you to address for me at the grassroots level with the uh, girls that you bring from the streets to the factory. A, do you work through an agency that rescues them and brings to you or do you bring them direct? And if you do bring them direct, well, what sort of pushback have you had to deal with? I guess because these girls are run by people. They see that they are losing income, they come to you. What sort of um, issues have you had to face there to um, keep things at bay? Thanks, Neil. That's a great question. Um, what are the issues that we face around um, bringing these these um, women into working with Outland Denim? Do we use an agency? Do we go direct um, in the rescuing process? And what's the pushback against that process, um, potentially from the perpetrators themselves? Uh, well, we use a, an agency. Um, we use a range of agencies um, that uh, specialise in identification and rescuing of these women. Um, often they will also just come to us now that we're getting a name and people are hearing about it. And in fact, there's so many people that want employment with us that, we, but we just can't give them jobs um, un yet. Pushback. The sad part is there is no pushback, and the reason is that being able to grab a woman off the street is really easy. Being able to coerce someone who's desperate, it's really easy. And so this is where I would say actually the rescue model, although necessary, is not the solution. The solution is economic. And if it is not come at from that angle, we will never change or solve anything. And so for us, it's about business. Business will change the world if we allow it to. And it's going to start with the rich countries like Australia um, that have resource to invest into these kinds of business models um, you know, I think of these two guys sitting at the table here, and I know the journey I've been on to be able to get investment, and I don't know if either of them are looking for it, but from what I heard from both of those two guys, if I had, if I had um, a spare million dollars in my pocket, I'd be looking for people that have the drive that they have to fund it. If you can fund it, not only can it give you an incredible return, and in fact, at this time in history is the biggest opportunity I think we're ever going to have. In fact, I think it's a turning point in history. I think this exact time will go down in history books as being when everything started to change. But it only changes when we put our investment dollars behind the businesses that are genuine about wanting to create change. And here's the thing, if you are genuine about wanting to create change and you're smart with the products you produce and you make sure there's a market for it, unlike what I did, um, you probably have a pretty incredible chance of success right now based on we're at the just at the beginning of this trajectory of growth with consumers being willing to spend more. And there's a lot of research and study done around it and we are not halfway up, we are just starting. And that's because of education. People becoming educated to the need um, and therefore wanting to su support businesses like this because we're tired of charity. So there's great opportunity in amongst the devastation here for businesses to earn more um, and for people to be helped right the way around the world. And so I know that's a long way of getting about your question. Um, it's kind of added a lot in there, but um, we have to work with those who specialise in the rescuing and identification process, and it's all about collaboration. You cannot, you cannot do this alone. Uh, Rob said the same thing. You need help and support, and that's why co-starters is vital, um, and being able to work with... Um, those who have been there before you to, to give you that kickstart and, and then have the support on every part of the journey all the way through. So, hope that answers. Yeah. So, maybe two more questions. So, Hi, I'm Bronwyn from ACCI, Australian Christian Churches International, field worker in the south of Thailand with the sector in the industry. Uh, congratulations on your work. I'm really, really impressed. 
impressed hearing about the 130 girls who are working with you and the 800 odd that are affected directly from that. Do you currently have any plans to expand this business model into other regions of Southeast Asia to replicate that sort of work in maybe other, other fields but across Southeast Asia? And if so, do you think that model would work in other areas? And is there anything on the way to do that? question is, uh, is another great question. Um, it could lead into a long-winded response as well, but uh, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, the question was, do we have um, the vision to expand it into other areas of Southeast Asia or any other areas? Um, absolutely. We started this business model from the very beginning um, that it could be dropped into any culture. Um, so although um, Khmer culture is different to Australian culture or Turkish culture or wherever, um, the fundamentals of the business model always remain the same. The only things that change is the way we relate to a culture and the product we produce. If we were producing here in Australia, and there's a lot of need for something like this here in Australia as well, we would need to produce a different product or at least a product at a different price point. And believe it or not, jeans themselves can be sold anywhere from, you know, what we know, like $8 at Kmart to thousand dollars or more so there's lots of opportunity and it's just choosing the market that you you are selling to so for us you know where I've always had my eyes on um, Eastern Europe I think it's a different kettle of fish there you're dealing with the mafia and things like that it, it's not as easy probably for them to get um, to staff their brothels and things so there would be a lot of learning in every culture to to go through um, but we are absolutely about a model that'll have satellites everywhere. And that mitigates risk as well. I mean, we're in a country that has some challenges. Um, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen from one election to the next. And so therefore, um, by being able to offset that risk in having something in PNG or who knows where. Um, but we only have the, we have two sites in Cambodia at the moment, yeah. One last question. Um, yeah, Quickly launched a website in the UK with no stock and pre-sold them. <laughs> Honestly, uh, yeah, man, the, the challenges that we faced as selling out so quickly, um, it was very educational on the level of um, be prepared for these kinds of things and, and we'd never done this before, so we've learned a lot. But um, it's how do you still, although we can't sell you a product, can we still have your email address or can we still connect with you when we've got them back in stock? Well, that was six months ago. We actually started pre-selling the jeans and they were told on the website it could be a four to six month wait. Well, it's now six months and they've only just got them. People continued to purchase. It's not because of our brand, it's because of Meghan Markle because, and we could, we could see this because the trend was they're buying exactly that product. Um, and, um, yeah, look, I, um, I, celebrities have so much power um, that I never gave them credit for because, in fact, if, if there was a celebrity sitting at that table there, I would purposely not even look at them um, because I, I'm like the typical Aussie that's like um, tall poppy. I'll make sure you you know you know better than any of us in here, right? You know. <laughs> Which is actually what makes Australia a really difficult place to operate in as well. Um, and in fact, I've been told if you can sell in Australia, you can sell anywhere in the world. And my experience probably is absolutely that. It's been a really tough market here. But also, when Australia gets behind you, then you have real power. Because Australians do have a lot of heart. And we do want to stand for something. And so if you can engage the Australian community, you've got something very, very powerful on your side. So James, my question is, what's your biggest challenge at the moment? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, wow. Talk about being vulnerable. Um, HR. Um, HR is my greatest challenge. Um, followed by always having enough capital um, to, to grow as fast as we've grown. So although there's lots of sales, Meghan Markle has cost us a fortune. Um, you know, and... Um, but on a HR level, it's um, how do you combine cultures? I've got um, experts from Turkey and um, America and Australia and Cambodia coming together. And when you've got experts from all these cultures coming together, thinking their way is the best way, it creates lots of problems. 
And uh, you know, like uh, this is being absolutely vulnerable, but you know, when you, when you, um, as a leader, think um, that you're very uh, open-minded and um, what would you call it? Um, willing to hear everybody's idea and you start to realise that you're actually the same. You know, I'll go into a situation and I'll be like, no, it's this and it's this and I'll be firm and stubborn and then have to stop and realise that, you know, I'm no different and in fact I don't know the best way all the time and I go back to, you know, if we can take the best of everybody's knowledge and put it together then, then there's something. But that's actually really hard, you know, um, you know to, to be able to get to a place where you can humble yourself. I'm not a very humble person. I'm, I'm always battling that and um, pig-headed and stubborn. And although that can be your strength in the, in the times of adversity, it can be your weakness as well. And so for me, I'm always battling that and trying to get to a place where I'm not arrogant and pig-headed and it's my way or the highway kind of attitude. So, yeah. Well, James, I want to pray for you. Is yeah, that okay? Please, please. I need it. Uh, Thank you so much for your vulnerability today. I, uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Father, we thank you that the Spirit of the Lord rests upon James. We ask the Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding We come upon him like has never come upon him before. That he would be a man who fears God and a man of quick understanding. That he'd be able to look at the problems before him and be able to know this is the way to walk in it. Father, we pray for the capital he needs. We pray for the staffing he needs. We pray for the even the, the little issues that probably plague him every day, that you would give him solution after solution. Protect him and his wife and his family. Father, surround them with a hedge of protection that they may grow and develop as they walk together on this journey and where you are taking them. Bless him. Bless Outland Denim. Father, may the favor of God rest upon him each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You know, putting on a breakfast like this is not easy, but that makes it all the worthwhile, doesn't it, to hear the story. And I really appreciate your vulnerability, James, because it's, it's one thing to see something in the press and see something happen but the story behind the story is really what we want to hear because you guys each one in the room you're out there every day and you're like um overcoming fear and needing to pick up the phone and phone people and build a relationship and you've got this crazy idea that you think might work but like uh pemba had you know 200 products he had to cut down to how many was it four or five it's 30 products. He had to cut it down. And that's a lot of dream giving up. But yet the end result is a, is a business that flies.